Um, there might be decisions ahead that would change the internet that we see, see it being used today. Uh, the likelihood of that, I don't know, but there are definitely issues and proposals out there with presently unknown consequences. I have summoned four very competent speakers, each representing different interests and views on this subject, and we will find their background and occupation in the web program, so I don't take time to repeat that too much. The speakers are um, Vesa Tereve from the European Union Commission, and he works with regulations uh, that um, includes the net neutrality, of course, uh, on the organization that is headed by Mrs. Uh, Nelly Cruz. We have Mathis van Bergen from Bits of Freedom in Holland. He's one of the architects behind the Dutch law from the May this year that protects net neutrality uh, uh, stronger than what uh, the EU directive has uh, made mandatory. And we have um, Jean-Jacques Sahel from Microsoft Skype. Skype is the important part here. Some of you may have seen him this summer uh, on the Eurodig conference. And then we have online from Krakow in Poland, Luigi Gambardello, Gambardella, sorry, Luigi, um, uh, the chair of the executive board at the European Telecommunication Networks Operators Association. Uh, whose members are the large telecom operators in Europe, those that in their previous incarnation were the state agencies running telecommunication systems under state monopolies until uh, the early 90s. I look forward to an intense panel debate after the presentations, and therefore I have asked the speakers to limit their presentations to give way for at least 20 minutes panel discussion. And I ask you all to hold your questions until the panel, and I will give you then instructions both online and here on how you, you, you forward your questions to us. By that, I will leave the floor to Vesa Tereve from the EU Commission. Vesa. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jan already mentioned uh, uh, Nelly Cruz and, uh, and her announcement on net neutrality, and I, I believe that that is the reason why I was invited to speak uh, here, here today. Uh, some people may ask that uh, why the Commission only acts now, whereas the others may ask that why the Commission acts uh, in the first place at all. Uh, I have prepared a long presentation as I'm a civil servant and uh, want to hide behind the slides, but I focus only on a few points and I, I try not to bore you too much. Uh, first of all, uh, when we are talking about net neutrality, we of course need to understand what we are talking about, and that is not uh, uh, so obvious because it depends very much on the interest group or, or the uh, a stakeholder you represent. There are different definitions for, for net neutrality, uh, starting from the basic basic definition that the network, network neutrality is the principle that all internet traffic should be treated equally. And then, then you go from absolute non-discrimination to the principle of no restrictions, and, and, and then, then, you, then you redefine it by allowing uh, a limited uh, discrimination quality of service or first come, first served uh, principle or, or different variations. So we have, we have plenty of definitions. We, from, uh, from the European Union perspective, we, of course, uh, we work on the basis of our legal framework, and there we have defined this principle as, as, uh, as uh, end user, so that end users should have the ability to access and distribute information or run applications and services of, of their choice. Uh, we have a legal framework in place uh, since 2009, and uh, in that framework we have a number of provisions which enable, at the member state level, the regulators in charge of regulating telecoms market to address the issue of net neutrality with, uh, with different tools. There's the, uh, the uh, 
main principle that uh, NRAs, national regulatory authorities, they must promote the ability of end users to access and distribute information and run services of their choice. And then we have a number of more specific provisions um, uh, ranging from transparency requirements, uh, possibility for regulators to the set the quality of service uh, uh, requirements. We have rules on switching and uh, rules on e-privacy to protect uh, um, citizens' uh, privacy and, and, and data protection. I already mentioned that we have a number of definitions and, and, and uh, the, the debate o, uh, uh, on net neutrality is it's, uh, it's, uh, very intensive, uh, at least uh, at the moment when, uh, when regulators or, or whoever policymakers propose to, to intervene. And that is of course obvious because we have a, a, a number of stakeholders whose interests are involved. We have end users who want to have information uh, on what they, they pay for. They, they would like to have affordable prices and access to the content or applications of, of their choice. And then for that, we need internet service providers who build the networks and, uh, and provide access to, to internet. And they, of course, uh, they need to protect uh, their investments and they, of course, have to uh, get return on their investments. At the same time, of course, Content providers that play an uh, important important role. There would, wouldn't be any need for internet service providers to be in the market if there was no content uh, to be accessed by end users. And then you have uh, a number of uh, intermediary players, transit providers, and they all have they they might have uh, common objectives and and uh, targets, but they clearly have also. Uh, uh, objectives which uh, contradict uh, with, uh, with uh, each other. Now, why the Commission is acting now? And, and here I have a slide on, on the uh, traffic uh, management investigation the body of the European regulators carried out over, over last year. And this slide uh, I suppose it depends, again, who is uh, interpreting this slide. But uh, for us, uh, for the European Commission, this slide indicates that uh, there is an issue, there's a problem in, um, in net neutrality which needs to be addressed. Uh, the, the main thrust of these uh, results uh, is that peer-to-peer uh, that, uh, -peer and, uh, and voice over IP traffic, there are at least one fifth of the end users who are affected uh, by, uh, by a number of restrictions on behalf of their internet uh, service provider. Of course, the fact that, uh, that end users are affected uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, restrictions as such is not necessarily a problem, but there are, but, uh, well, there are, there are a couple of things I would like to, to, to make here. I suppose that if the market uh, is uh, really competitive, the, the retail uh, internet access market, and if consumers could exercise their choice so that they have transparent information, they really know what is uh, available in the market, and if they are not satisfied, they, they would have a chance to easily switch from one operator to other. I believe that in, in, in that scenario, in those circumstances, there would be uh, le uh, less people who would be affected by restrictions. And, and, and then secondly, of course, the transparency. So if, if this was a result uh, in a situation where all internet users, if they knew that they, they were subject to, to, to these uh, restrictions uh, which are behind these figures, and if they had a possibility to switch, then obviously, obviously this, this situation um, would not be such a big problem, but uh, we, I think we have uh, strong reasons to believe that there is not sufficient transparency and there is not no uh, uh, easy way always to switch uh, from one operator to another. So that was the first reason why we concluded that it's, it's time for the European Commission to act. And, and the second reason is that um, we have a number of initiatives uh, uh, already 
legislation which has been adopted or, or, or projects or plans for adopting new legislation in, in a number of uh, EU member state, states. And, and we believe that it would be beneficial for the internal market, for the uh, uh, market players, be it say, internet uh, service providers or content providers, if we have our common rules and common understanding how the regulatory framework should be applied. And this is the reason why, um, why we are now working on, we are working on a recommendation. It's, it's not a very heavy legislative tool, but we are intending to give guidance on, on how those uh, provisions in the legal framework I, I mentioned earlier, on how they should be applied in a consistent way so that we uh, enhance the consumer choice, we enhance transparency and we enhance competition giving at the same time not only uh, possibility for internet service providers to compete more efficiently uh, amongst themselves, but also content providers to uh, enter into markets and provide uh, uh, new innovative services to end users. And I think I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vesa. Uh, the next speaker then is Mathis van Bergen from Bits of Freedom, Holland, as for the Dutch law. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this session. Thank you organizers for inviting me to be on this interesting panel and for giving me some time to talk about net neutrality regulation in the Netherlands. Thank you, co-panelists, for your presentations and for listening to me now and discussing with me later. Please allow me to introduce myself very briefly. I will try to keep it very brief, but I believe that in discussions like these, it is important for all speakers to be transparent about what interests may be represented in some way within the statements and vision uh, they represent. Within the context of this discussion, I consider myself first and foremost uh, an internet citizen. Speaking in the latest EU telecom framework legalese, I may be just a consumer of an electronic communication service, but I consider that term to be inadequate for this discussion. Rather, I believe I am a citizen of a global information society which has its home on the internet. Together with over two billion other internet citizens, I inhabit the cyberspace that has come to be all around us now. Bits of Freedom is a well-known and reputable not-for-profit foundation in the Netherlands that tries to protect civil rights of cyber citizens like me. As stated in the description of this panel, Bits of Freedom was a main driver behind the Dutch law for net neutrality. The views I express here will to a very large extent co-align with those of Bits of Freedom, but as a matter of principle are my own. I am not employed by Bits of Freedom, but I support their views on net neutrality, and I have taken an active part in helping to form those views and to communicate them. In many ways, having access to the internet makes things possible that were not possible before, as Larry Lessig explained so eloquently yesterday. It has empowered so many people across the globe, and myself as well. Thanks to the internet, seven years ago, my current employer was able to found a company while he was still studying law at the age of 22. The company was and is called ICT Recht. Four years ago, having the age of 22 as well, I started to work there while I was still doing my master's in information law. At the time, the company had no physical office yet, and I worked only from home. Now it has quite a nice office, but I'm still able to work from home a lot and from abroad thanks to the internet. In my free time, I conduct PhD research about net neutrality in relation to fundamental rights, specifically uh, the right to freedom of speech and the right to privacy. I do this at the University of Leiden. So I will start off very briefly with some uh, more academic concepts and rationales that underpin the uh, Dutch law for net neutrality. Please bear with me briefly. I will also explain the practical application of the law a bit later on. 
So in studying this uh, issue intensively and reading all the great stuff that the big minds of people like Wu, Lessig, Van Schewick, uh, Balkin, and Solomon Chung came up with, I noticed a remarkable resemblance between fundamental design principles of the internet and fundamental constitutional principles of democracies. Lessig taught us that code is law and the internet has a lot of democracy coded into it. The most important similarity which I found is that the end-to-end -end principle in networking closely resembles the subsidiarity principle in constitutional democracies. Both principles, in essence, prescribe that power and autonomy should remain decentralized when it can and should only be centralized if it's really necessary. Some very smart people, like those on the slide uh, behind me, have spent a lot of time on such ideas. You might know them from left to right, left to right Thomas Aquinas, Montesquieu, and John Locke. In many ancient societies, the people served their king or lord and were subject to his authority. Yes, it was usually a man too. Eventually, many countries in the world wised up. In constitutional democracies, the state serves the people. This principle was also coded into the internet. On the internet, the network serves the edges, or at least that's how it's been mostly so far. Unfortunately, over the last decade or so, internet access providers seem to have grown jealous of the Googles and Amazons of this world and have been trying to find ways to get a bigger piece of the pie. They seek ways to control over what content and services can be delivered and accessed over the internet so that they can monetize uh, the value that the applications and content present to the users. What they are trying to do undermines the separation of the transport layer and the content layer of the internet, which is another strong democratic element in the technological architecture of the internet. It can be compared with the separations of power doctrine. So this quote by AT&T CEO Ed Whitaker from 2005 exemplified the greed which the telcos have displayed. He claims that Google, Yahoo, and Vonage uh, are, quote, using my lines for free, and that's bull, uh, unquote. No, Mr. Whitaker, that's bull. The subscribers of AT&T are paying AT&T to give them access to the internet, the whole internet, and the services of Google, Yahoo, and Vonage just happen to be popular services. Content and application providers do already pay to get their stuff on the internet. Users pay access providers to get access to the internet because they want the ability to use all of those valuable online services made by other companies than the access providers themselves. In effect, Mr. Whitaker wanted to get paid twice for the same thing. Mr. Whitaker's comment intensified the debate about net neutrality in the US, where regulation was adopted in 2010. In May 2011, KPN, which is the Dutch incumbent telecom operator, showed that it had got greedy too. In a presentation to its shareholders, it presented a plan to ramp up its dividends against the backdrop of declining SMS usage and therefore income. The greedy kitty here gets away with its greed by being irresistibly cute. But the KPN boys, they were trying to be cute. But as I will explain, their plans weren't cute at all. So what were their not-so-cute plans? KPN wanted to, quote, monetize WhatsApp. Monetize here is a euphemism for charging users money to refrain from blocking WhatsApp. Yes, as some of you may immediately figure, and for the others it's right there on the slide, that is a lot like me asking you money not to slap you in the face. When the presentation at the shareholders meeting reached the Dutch internet citizens, they reacted furiously. Now that the internet and smartphones together finally made it possible to send text messages for a fair price, which is next to nothing because text messages cost next to no bandwidth, KPN announced it wanted to get money to not block it, so it wouldn't suffer so much from declining SMS usage. I guess we should all have felt really sorry for KPN. To add insult to injury, those rascals from KPN proudly announced that they were the first telco uh, to, to use deep packet inspection to monetize a specific app. Those of you who don't know, DPI is a technology that can be used to look deep into internet packages, even into the actual content. 
So this is what happens when internet providers uh, start charging users extra to refrain from blocking specific services. The internet is degraded to a kind of glorified TV package subscription. Users have to pay extra for all, uh, for all the websites and services that are valuable to them. And the internet providers can weaken competition by making bundles just not exactly interchangeable. I mean, how does one choose between Wikipedia and YouTube, for example? Making users choose between those two is not giving them more choice, it's giving them more choices but less value for money and less freedom. Online service and content providers can be priced out of business by another company totally unrelated to them. You can make a nice online service and suddenly the telco incumbent who didn't make your service uh, but just transports the packets runs off with your money. If there's even any money left because maybe many people like the service when it was free but wouldn't use it if they had to pay for it. So thankfully, we aren't at this dystopian situation which I described yet. Uh, but where are we then? Beric, the organization of European telecom authorities, has spent a lot of time and effort looking into the discriminatory practices of telcos. Uh, the, the report was mentioned uh, by the previous speaker as well. The results leave no doubt. Internet providers frequently block or throttle specific applications on the internet. Sure. Excuse me. <laughs> you can all read it, it's very big. Uh, more specifically, at least 20% of all users and potentially up to half of all mobile internet users uh, have contracts that allow restriction of services like VoIP or P2P. About 90% of operators with contractual restrictions on P2P uh, enforce them technically. Contractual restrictions on VoIP are technically enforced by more than half of the mobile operators. So finally, I get to talk about the law that was enacted in the Netherlands that will put a stop to this. The law provides that internet access providers cannot slow down or hinder applications and services on the internet unless, this is, and this is stressed, necessary to A, minimize the effects of congestion, giving equal treatment to equal types of traffic, or B, preserve the integrity and security of the network, service, and terminal equipment, or C, restrict, restrict spam if the user has given consent, or D, give effect to a legislative provision or court order. So how should this provision be applied? The explanatory memorandum explains that the law should be applied in a similar manner as how the European Court of Human Rights applies Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects freedom of speech. As a legal scholar, I find it very interesting, uh, very elegant, that the format of Article 10 was remixed in such a way to maximize the freedom of Internet citizens. So there are five simple step, steps. <clears throat> the first step is to determine if the traffic is slowed down or hindered. If, uh, if not, there is no problem. If it is the case, we go to step two. The second step is to see whether such a measure, measure is prescribed by the contract or the general terms. If the contract doesn't provide for the measure, the measure is illegal. The third step is to check if there is a legitimate aim for the measure. The aims are listed exhaustively in the law, and the purpose of the measure has to fit with at least one of those. The fourth step is to determine if the measure is actually necessary in a democratic end-to-end -end network. Can't the problem be solved at the edges? If it can, and it can be solved well, then the central measure is illegal. The fifth step is to determine the proportionality. Isn't there another measure possible that is less severe? A good example here is the Comcast case. Comcast hindered peer-to-peer -peer applications, saying it was ne necessary to mitigate congestion. However, the measures were not linked to actual congestion levels, but they were permanent. Therefore, under this test, the measure is not proportionate. The Human Rights Court leaves the member states a certain margin of appreciation to decide for themselves what measures are necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. In accordance with this concept, the Dutch law for net neutrality leaves internet providers a margin of appreciation to decide for themselves what measures on their networks are necessary and proportionate. It makes a lot of sense to leave more margin of appreciation when competition is strong and switching is easy. Market incentives will then mostly, mostly but perhaps not completely, drive internet providers to refrain from acting negatively. 
There, there can also be a wider margin of appreciation when there is less consensus among technicians about the necessity and effectivity of a measure. So what does this all mean concretely? This means that internet providers can't blackmail providers of online content and applications to pay for not getting blocked. This means that internet providers can't force users to pay extra if they want to keep using their favorite applications. This means that if there is congestion, proportionate measures can be taken to make sure that stuff keeps working as well as possible. Uh, but paying for priority is not allowed. If you allow paying for preferential treatment, the incentive to invest in the network is gone. Because preferential treatment is only useful and valuable if the normal treatment is bad enough. On a good network, you don't need preferential treatment to have a good conference call over Skype. And under the Dutch law, in times of congestion, more time critical applications on the internet, such as video calling and gaming, can be prioritized over time, less time critical applications, such as email and file sharing. So here's a nice cartoon under a Creative Commons license, which pictures the internet super tollway situation. Uh, it says, the next free medium 20 years ahead. So the Dutch law does not regulate IP-based services over private IP networks, which are not internet access services. IP TV and VoIP can be offered next to the open internet, but it is not allowed to slow down or block Skype, uh, YouTube, or any other particular online service to make those separate IP services more attractive. And of course, it is always the best to let the user control as much as possible what applications have priority and when. With that, I don't mean control through picking a plan that is set for the contract term, but control like, like in having a control panel, uh, which the user can herself use to set the desired parameters for traffic management. In summary, my message today is that net neutrality can be well regulated. The Dutch law is strict, but also fair and flexible too. It was made democratically by the parliament and the government, following the advice of a grassroots non-profit organization that represents internet citizens and fights for their freedom. Finally, it realizes important goals which are already in the current framework directive on telecom. Those goals are to make net neutrality a policy objective and to promote the ability of end users to access and distribute information or run applications and services of their choice. So, why don't we adopt this solution EU-wide? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Mathis. And then I leave the floor to Jean-Jacques Sahel from Skype, or Microsoft Skype, rather. Go ahead, Jean-Jacques. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Really glad to be here at Internet Days. Uh, I think this is my third uh, Internet Dagger now. Um, and that's saying something quite unfortunate, which is that I've been talking about net neutrality for far too long. And the reason is, it's been going on as a problem in Europe for far too long. Uh, I don't have slides. I could almost reuse uh, bits of freedom slides. Um, let me just check, start a, a bit like Vesa did with, with um, with explaining what is net neutrality, or indeed what is the open character of the internet. We prefer to talk about the open internet because indeed there's too many definitions of net neutrality. And actually I agree fully with Vesa's choice. Uh, it's, it's a recital in, the, uh, in one of the directives which talks about the fact that end users should have the ability to access the content of their choice or run the applications of their choice on the internet. It seems obvious to anyone uh, that it should be the case, I think. And what's very interesting for us is that it's behind this, this idea that end users should have choice. You know, if you connect to the internet, you should do what you want. It's basically this fundamental architectural principle behind the internet, which is the end-to-end -end principle. If I am an endpoint of the internet, a user, uh, for instance, I can connect to any other endpoint of the internet without any barriers, pretty much. And that very basic principle that you can have interaction between whoever is connected or whatever is connected to this network of networks without barriers is 
the main reason, the fundamental reason why the internet has become such a powerful vehicle for economic, social, political uh, progress over the past 20 years globally. Um, I, don't, I don't need to give examples, uh, partly because there's just far too many of them. You know, this free flow of information we've enjoyed is just phenomenal. And to, well, maybe I'll just use one example. Just imagine 10 years ago, um, a Swede and a Dane and a bunch of crazy Estonians coming up with a piece of software that they put out there online, which enables people to communicate over the internet without, uh, without barriers and, and in, in novel ways. You know, Skype. Would we have been able to do that if there had been barriers? Well, probably not. And actually, we see that it would probably not have been the case with the many barriers that we see, uh, we, uh, that we have seen appear, especially in terms of the mobile access of the, uh, of the internet over the past few years. Um, we've mentioned the BEREC study of 400 ISPs. Um, what's interesting is that you know, it, it tells you already some pretty bad figures. Uh, about the percentage of mobile users in Europe who are affected. But actually what it, it probably doesn't say, I don't think we've seen it in the slides, is that there are some countries in Europe where you know, no mobile operator lets you use VOIP or peer-to-peer. -peer. You don't have a choice unless you move country. Or in fact, if you look at global level, you actually have to move continent because the EU, and Western Europe in particular, is the worst region in the world in terms of the, those restrictions, arbitrary restrictions of access. We've known that. I've been saying that since 2008, since I, started, since I joined Skype. And we're still here, almost five years on, and frankly, nothing's happened, really, apart from a few nice little cases uh, here or there, like the Netherlands, and, 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 and some decent recommendations here or there in some countries. But the problem is we still have a systemic, massive problem in Europe of net neutrality, and we need action now. Why do we need action? Because you know, it's not actually just about voice over IP and peer-to-peer. -peer. Actually, if you look behind, you know, there's other uses that are forbidden, depending on which mobile operator you look around in Europe. Some of them forbid video and audio use in their contracts. Um, and actually, some of them forbid video, audio, tethering, VPN, VOIP, peer-to-peer. -peer. I think basically you can see a few web pages and, and, uh, and, and maybe do a bit of email. And that's not a joke, and that's not tiny little weird mobile operators. We're talking about people with 25% of the market share in, in, in large EU member states. Um, what, what is even more worrying is that the trend is not stopping. Even though there's been some attention, uh, there's clearly not been enough attention. Uh, the trend is, is, is growing, and as more and more people are accessing the internet over mobile, what we risk seeing is exactly the sort of uh, scenario that, that Matthias talked about before, which is, you know, you pay for internet access, which in fact is really just web surfing and email, but then you have to pay extra, if you're allowed, to uh, use VOIP, and then you pay extra again for video, and you pay extra again for gaming, and you pay extra again for whatever other uses. And then basically, you make the internet as we know today, at best, something which is affordable to only the richest segment of the population. Uh, is this really the sort of social and, and economic picture that we want for the EU? I hope not. Um, and you know, then we start looking at, 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 at sort of some of the, the solutions. And I'm hearing, you know, well, what about switching, voting with your feet? You know, if if uh, if we had competitive enough markets, then consumers could just say, hey, hold on, I don't want those restrictions. I'll just move to another operator that doesn't have those restrictions. So I've already mentioned in some countries in Europe, you just can't do that because all the operators have those restrictions. Or you might be in one of those many regions in Europe where you have only one or two providers, mobile providers at your disposal, and they might all have those same restrictions. And then, more importantly, and as this has been actually luckily noted by um, the European Group of Regulators, BEREC, the fact is, <laughs> Would you switch operator if, say, Facebook was blocked? Probably. Would you switch if Google search was blocked, Bing search? Probably. Would you switch if Skype was blocked? Well, unfortunately, it looks like we're not popular enough. Um, and would you switch for you know, this or that blog being forbidden, for BitTorrent being overly degraded, etc., etc., etc.? Well, the evidence shows, no, you wouldn't. It's just too difficult. Competition between ISPs, competitive markets can deliver a lot of good things. 
such as better prices, such as better coverage, perhaps. But can you use that simply a bit more information and, and, this, and even an enhanced ability to switch to protect net neutrality? Can you take that chance? Well, actually, no. You need to do a little bit more. There's a clear problem with what we're seeing today and, 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 and the worry we have for the future of user choice. Why shouldn't users do what they want online, access whichever site they want? The only exemptions to, 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 to uh, users being able to choose what they want is if indeed there's real, genuine congestion at certain times, or indeed there might be a problem of network security that needs to be addressed. If it's not for those genuine, reasonable, justifiable reasons, why shouldn't users do what they want when they've paid for internet access or paid for something which they believe is internet access? Why should they have to look into page 35, footnote 4 of the TNCs or fair use policies or whatever is hidden in, uh, in, in, in an obscure page of the website of an operator to realize what they can and can't do with their internet access? It's bad for users. It's bad for innovation. Why should we, why should any app developer out there think, hold on, uh, should I really be using peer-to-peer -peer as a protocol because I know it's being throttled to death by loads of operators. You know, we didn't see that, but there's at least one country that, in Europe that was mentioned in the Berek finding where 95% of users have got their peer-to-peer -peer degraded. You know, so what do you do? Well, you use another technology, even if it might not be the technology you want. Will you launch a VOIP application? Well, you might think twice about it. You know, think about Viber, you know, a great little VOIP company. Uh, chaired by a, a Romanian guy, 20-odd uh, people when they started. They were extremely successful when they launched, I think it was in December 2010. They got millions of users within three weeks. Do you know what happened within three weeks? They started being degraded and blocked by operators left, right, and centers all over Europe. Is that right? Is that good for innovation? Is that how we're going to have the next Google in Europe? We're not going to have the next Google in Europe if we let innovation be just throttled, muzzled, without taking any action. The fact is there's fairly simple things we can do. And I think Vesa has told us already the, the path that the Commission is, is, is going to take and issue some guidance. I think that guidance is much needed, but of course, what is in the guidance is going to be very important. We need quite clearly in that guidance to have much more than just another tweak to how users should be informed or not, or maybe some extra uh, you know, reinforcements of how you can switch operator. This is just not going to be sufficient. We need, at the very least, a very clear explanation of what is acceptable traffic management versus what is unacceptable, illegitimate traffic management. You know, if you look at some of the work done by the French regulator, for instance, they've already stated, recommended, that view, uh, blocking VOIP or overcharging for it is illegitimate. There is no good reason for it from an economic or technical perspective. So that's the sort of thing that we'd like to see much more clearly explicited in EU guidance. And it doesn't need to be overly detailed. There's plenty of examples already. Again, for instance, the French regulator is a good example. They said that you simply need to make sure that you have a clear scope for, what is, for judging what is acceptable traffic management. It should be justified, it should be reasonable, it should be time-limited, proportionate. Similar things in the Dutch law, similar things in the Singapore decision, similar things in the Chilean law, similar things in the US legislation. Again, quite a few places around the world, actually Israel just introduced a very similar bill resembling the Dutch, Dutch law. You know, there's plenty of examples out there of regulatory best practice, and they're all saying the same thing using the same wording. It would be great to see that reproduced in European guidance. And the fact is, we're not actually asking about new legislation. What we're saying is, you know, we've already got in the existing legislation in Europe some protections of net neutrality, but they are high level. They need to be detailed. We need to understand what is inappropriate traffic management. We need to understand that national regulatory authorities will take action to stop undue restrictions to what users can do uh, with their internet access. NRA should be proactive in doing so. It's already there. You've, you might have seen in, in, in Veza's slide that it talks about uh, you know, regulators being able to mandate quality of, uh, of service requirements. What this article also says is that regulators should do that in order to prevent blocking and degradation of service. It doesn't say 
to correct it or anything. It says, no, even before the problems appear. So it's already there in the law. Regulators should be proactive in preventing any bad behavior. We need that clearly explicited. There are other aspects, such as the privacy elements of traffic management. You know, is traffic management employed or deployed, rather, in a way that is so intrusive as to be illegitimate, illegal? Or indeed, do you need to obtain prior consent from the users before putting it in place? Many questions, and I, and I hope the Commission can, can address that. I, I'm sure they can address that, although I know there's a lot of work ahead for that. And I think we can see new services being proposed by ISPs. You know, they can provide internet access alongside other services. It's already being done today. I have no problem with, actually, my ISP, for instance, uh, offers me video on demand. That's fine. And they provide me with great, uninhibited, unrestricted access to all of the internet. Fantastic. Fine. And I'll buy their stuff, and I'll buy stuff from others through my open internet access. No problem. And we can have those net neutrality rules being clarified by the Commission without hurting anyone and not hurting the telecom operators in the first place. Let's think about this for a second. How are telecom operators going to make money in the future? And actually, many of them now. Through internet access. How do you encourage consumers, users, to buy internet access? Do you tell them that they can buy a wonderful antenna made out of platinum or whatever, or a wonderful cable with like the latest technology for fiber? No, you're telling them there's exciting new content, applications and services. There's Skype video calling you can do. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's whatever is the latest stuff that's going to encourage people to buy internet access. So let innovation happen, protect it through net neutrality, and we can all be happy, we can have a great internet ecosystem, we can have free flow of information, we can have innovation, we can have contribution to economic growth, rather than going backwards 30 to 40 years to the cable TV model. Let's show the way. We look forward to the EU making the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I sit here so, so Luigi will see me. Um, and the next speaker then is Luigi Gamardella from um, uh, 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 the Ethno Organization, the European Telecommunication Network Operators Association, as I mentioned. And he is with us now from Krakow in Poland. And I'm very grateful to you that you um, decided to endure this uh, online uh, participation. I hope it will be as if you were here. So, Luigi, thank you. Yes. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jan and the organizer. It's not working. I have some problem. We hear you. We hear you. It's OK. I have some problem, Jan. Can you hear me? Yes. Perhaps we should, we should reduce. OK. Um, and I would like really to thank uh, you, Jan, and the organizer for arranging this uh, um, so that uh, even if I may say through Skype, uh, and I understand, we can understand why is, uh, is needed the quality of service. Because for me, it's been extremely difficult to, to, um, to follow the debate. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is one reason why we should look at the introduction of new services and a better quality services, which uh, all the consumer will benefit. And also, I was uh, really interested to listen to the lesson from Microsoft and uh, I, would have, uh, I hope that we'll have the chance to comment uh, what has been said later, because I have uh, my own speech and I would like to say a few things. But it's quite interesting that Microsoft has such kind of approach when we know how much costs the software. And, uh, and uh, when we buy a PC, uh, we perhaps should ask them to have for free the software. Uh, but uh, I will come back uh, uh, to that later. And uh, as you know, I would have loved to have been with you in, in, in your the beautiful city of Stockholm, but today we have our uh, Ethno General Assembly, and so therefore it will not be possible for me to be there. But uh, um, let me say a few things uh, on what uh, is uh, uh, our position, Ethno position, and what we believe 
uh, on the Europe approach on, uh, to the net neutrality. Uh, Etno believes that uh, Europe's approach to net neutrality can have a significantly positive impact on EU citizens and the European ICT sector. EU Commissioner Nelly Cruz has repeatedly stressed the need for an EU regulatory framework which promotes private investment in next generation networks. And the reality is that investment in these smart broadband networks in Europe crucially depends upon network operator freedom to innovate and develop a new business model in line with EU competition and consumer protection rules. Etno advocates a holistic view of internet openness covering several dimensions. Users should be able to access any lawful content on the internet and access services and applications of their choice. Users should be able to benefit from differentiated offers in line with their individual preferences. The principles of openness, transparency and competition should be adherent to by all players in the internet value chain and should not be limited to operators of electronic communication networks. We as Ethno members and Ethno members are committed to providing transparent and meaningful information to end users on their services of choice and as required by the existing telecom regulatory framework. Transparency requirements strengthen the positive effects of competition with regard to internet access service. However, transparency requirements for internet access provider must respect the fact that the access segment is just one element within the chain of interoperated networks. The quality of experience of any given end user is the result of interaction between several actors along the value chain and, it, and Ethno believes that all actors have a shared responsibility. Although interest in this issue has grown in the last couple of years, the use of traffic management techniques is not, is not new. It has been and continues to be a vital tool in supporting the efficient and secure operation of the internet and providing a good quality of experience for the end user. Network management is an indispensable means to control network congestion in view of rapidly increasing IP data traffic volumes and, importantly, it can be done without analyzing the actual content that is transmitted and not affecting citizens' fundamental rights such as the freedom of expression. Ethno simply wants to avoid decisions that would prevent new business models from emerging or that would hamper differentiated offers, hence limiting consumer choice. The risk of undesirable economic and technical regulation of operator rates, terms and conditions will be much higher if the development of internet continue to be jeopardized by the lack of sustainability and or by the lack of end consumer satisfaction. From a technical point of view, it's clear that networks are evolving towards an all IP platform where quality of service is becoming a central element in the provision of access and content services. Quality of service is needed. To deliver services such as streaming video, which require a guaranteed minimum bit rate, latency, and error rail rate. To increase the customer base by improving the reach of some services, such as the delivery of films and video conferences. To guarantee that the internet is able to provide the services requiring strict network performance and to generate incremental revenues across all, or across all internet ecosystem through enhancing e-commerce transactions and improving customer experience of web searches. One final important point. No one will ever be cut from the internet. 
as a result of what Ettono is proposing. Best effort internet will continue to exist for all, as economy class will always be there on our flight. What we are pushing for is an additional layer above that for services that have additional delivery considerations. For me, I'm sorry, but it has been very difficult to follow and more difficult to speak because I, I, I listen my voice and therefore is extremely noise and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry for that. But I, I would love, if, if it's possible later, to make some comments about what I've heard during the previous interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. I'm sorry for the bad audio there. I'm not so sure whether it's the internet link. It might be the setup here as well. Uh, but may maybe you could discuss that with, with Jean-Jacques and, and Bjorn afterwards. <laughs> anyway, now we move into the, the um, um, panel here. And uh, I have some few instructions for you, both on the internet and here in, in, in the room. Um, uh, we will take questions from the floor and there, there will be a microphone available then. So just wave and someone will, will hand over a microphone to you then because that is important both for Luigi to hear and the web, for the webcast. Um, uh, for you on, that, are, that are the online audience, um, we use two hashtags. One hashtag is the IND12. You've probably already seen that on, on Twitter. Uh, that is the hashtag for the full conference. If you have any comments uh, or uh, questions that you hope that we, we will be able to uh, compile a question for, for the panel too. I have two, two um, friends at the Internet Society Sweden chapter here, Lars and Linda, that will follow those ha hashtags and they will communicate with me without any filtering on the internet uh, up to this one. So I'll see that in that case. So you also will be given a chance to input questions here. Uh, so that's, that's the instruction then for, 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 for the panel discussion here. And we'll try to keep... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the, uh, it would yes. be possible... Yes? May I make, it would be possible to make one comment before we start with questions. Yeah, I just wanted to say that when you have something then during the panel, yes. just wave at me. I will see you all the time. So I will see you here. And, yeah, because... Yeah. Okay. If it's possible, I would, allow, I would like to make this comment because I think it's important to have a common understanding of the situation. Otherwise, uh, it is difficult to, 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 I make it to, de, to, de, um, to have such kind of discussion. Uh, what has happened? What is happening? That clearly there is a, a clash. There are several clash. The first one is, uh, as you know, uh, uh, what we call an economic clash. So it means we believe that this system is not sustainable anymore. There is what we call, we have called this internet economic model sustainability. We believe that the system is, is broken and, and will break, could break. And we would like to fix the things before the system break. And this is why, because basically, what is happening, that the telecom operators are losing revenue. Just to give you a figure, in Europe, the telecom operator, this is the fourth year that will continue to lose revenue and more and more losing revenue. On the other hand, the traffic is booming and more and more investments are needed just to catch the, the level of, of, of the traffic growth, but also in parallel to invest on the new network like LTE and FAD. So first, there is, there is a, a very important economic issue there. But what, what we feel is that uh, there is a clear clash because uh, between two regions, Europe and the US, there are completely different situations. In Europe, we have a very fragmented, uh, re our region is very fragmented. Just to give you some numbers, in Europe we have more than 1,200 operators. Uh, we have 100 mobile, need, uh, mobile operators. 
Uh, Lu Luigi, could, could you make it short it so we could start the panel because otherwise the time is uh, going on here right now. So you can come back on that then in the okay. question and answers here. Okay, I would like to start the round here with first a sh very short round where you just in a few seconds each would give a few keywords on your perception of what is the essence of net neutrality. It could be everything from freedom to awful to to, to uh, some more meaningful uh, keywords. Just a few that you come to think of. And, and then I have one question uh, as for, for the religious presentation that I think will occupy all of you. And then I hope to be able to take questions from, from the floor as much as possible and the internet. Visa? I suppose uh, it's the end user is the focal point focus here. So end user citizens, they, uh, they uh, have to be able to participate in the, in the uh, uh, digital economy and democratic society and exercise their choice. Okay. Mathis? Uh, for me, it is to maximize freedom of internet users and protecting the free and open and also democratic architecture of the internet. Um, and yeah, I think it would be uh, a virtuous cycle. You know, we create great content and apps which make you know, users happy, they can do a lot of things with it, and therefore they have to buy internet access, so it makes revenues for telecom operators. And virtual cycle goes on, on and on. Net neutrality is good for everyone. Okay, Luigi. A few key words right now. What, what is the important thing for net neutrality as you see it, with a few, few key words only? Mm. Then the questions. For me. us, there are two key, two key words. First, transparency. Second, um, a minimum level of quality of service. And then what we would like to see, we would like to see more choice for the, for the customer. Okay, thank you. My first question then, and I think we'll engage all, all of you here, is based on what Luigi said here, and what is also reflected in the proposal to the ITU. We shouldn't really discuss whether the ITU was the right address or not, because that has been discussed very much in other things. We will focus on the, the content and how it relates to net neutrality. And looking at uh, uh, one of the clauses there, and you already mentioned it, you're saying, uh, that best effort delivery should continue to form the basis of international IP traffic exchange, and then this that you call the business class, uh, it is more formal here. And then you say, nothing shall preclude commercial agreements with differentiated quality of service delivery to develop. That is uh, the, the key sentence here that I will uh, form a question on, and that is, would that effectively mean that if there would be some kind of international agreement, treaty, or regulation, or whatever, you, you say shall here, would that really effectively mean that it would block the European Union, individual member states, and uh, Chile for that matter in, in, in South America, f from, and Holland then of course, to do and put law in effect uh, what, Ho what Holland already has done. Is that what it's mean? Um, uh, and then a follow-up question on that. Would it be possible for the European Union, whatever you decide right now for transparency and so mm -hmm. on, to waive the right to make their own decision later on to strengthen net neutrality law because of some international treaty, because would you abandon some of your sovereignty in that case? Uh, so, uh, who would uh, continue, I think, maybe Luigi? Is that the correct interpretation maybe that I have right made here? Person. Yeah, but, but uh, if, I, if I may, I would like to, um, to answer to, to your question, because you, you, you said several things. The yes. first point that is important, is very important to clarify this. All our customers are using internet. And today, internet is on the best effort. Therefore, it, and, and, and uh, we know how much competition there is in Europe, how many providers there, is, there, is in, there are in Europe. By the way, the level of competition that there, there is in Europe does not exist in the US. 
the, 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 level, the prices in Europe are, are less than half that are in US. So, and, and if someone starts to lower the level of the quality, we, we lose the customer. And no one wants to lose his own customers. This is very important to understand. And only a few customers will use certain services with certain level of different quality of service, which they want and they want to pay in a different way. So, and this is important to clarify the first element. The second one is regarding the ITU, Jan, because here it's very, it's very interesting. Uh, we should establish whether this treaty is important or not, is relevant or not, has some effects or not, because if the treaty has no effect, why, the, why there is such, much, so, such kind of discussion? Why is so important? And why, why uh, many states, they don't want to change them? Okay, so, uh, but again, would such, an tr tr uh, would, would such a treaty stop Holland from doing what Holland is doing right now? Visa? Obviously, uh, if we... Uh, <laughs> agree to certain rules at the international level in the, in the ITU context, obviously then we have to comply with those rules in our European and, or, or national legislation. I, I think this is, a, this is, a, this is how, how the hierarchy of these rules goes. Now, a couple of things. First of all, I should stress, because this has been stressed uh, also by, by my commissioner several times, so uh, we we do not, uh, we also believe, uh, like Louis said, that there should be room for different business models and uh, there are different demands. So quality of service is, uh, of course, important element of, uh, element of that. But also, uh, uh, what my commissioner has said, it is important to ensure the best effort, uh, best effort internet so that uh, the quality of service would not affect, affect the, the um, best effort internet for, for other users of internet. And, and then what, what, uh, um, what you mentioned about the, the ethno, ethno proposal, already I, I see their contradiction if you say that nothing shall preclude. That for me means that then there is no way that uh, we can guarantee the best effort internet if there's nothing which shall pre preclude. Because there might be circumstances that you really have to ensure that if you provide quality of service, that at the same time uh, you uh, ensure also the best effort internet. And if there is something which uh, the nothing precludes, then I think hand, our hands are tied. Can I reply briefly okay. about the, the point of the, the new business models and the development of new business models? Because I think the Dutch rules do not stifle positive new business models at all. It only stifles the negative ones, the ones I mentioned in my presentation, where effectively content providers are being blackmailed to pay money not to be blocked. This, this is also a new business model. It is called the Tony Soprano way of networking, and it should not be allowed. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just briefly, I think I made the point quickly during my presentation. You, know, you can have managed services running alongside the internet, so exactly. those commercial arrangements are alongside. fine. They already exist, well, actually, to some them. extent. But what you shouldn't have is is a development whereby, uh, for instance, the quality of the normal open internet is so degraded or becomes so expensive that if you're a content provider, you just have to enter into a contract for a managed service. Uh, so I think we're, we're, so it's completely different from the institutional discussion as to whether the ITU treaty matters, etc. I think basically there's room for a lot of new services to come along, but I think we've got this wonderful level playing field, this wonderful open platform that is the internet as we know it today, and we just cannot je jeopardize that. Doesn't mean we can't innovate in lots of new services, and, and it's being done. Mm. So uh, I, you know, I, I think there's room for a lot of good things. It's just not jeopardize good stuff that exists. Yeah. Running managed services, strong quality control end to end over the same IP infrastructure as the best effort, is that I, really something that could be done without hampering uh, yeah, the I mean, connectionless Atlantic model? It's not automatically an easy proposition, and you saw one of the slides that uh, Vesa showed showed various uh, aspects of how QoS could, could or is deployed. Depending on the infrastructure, it's not an issue at all. So you have some people that have, within the same fiber, they have two different signals going concurrently. You know, 
it's then you have no problem. You can deliver your managed services, and the internet access is running completely separate. Or you could, it could go through the same route. I think on mobile, mobile will be mobile access to the internet if there are ever managed services. It will be interesting to see how that's developed. And I think you know, we'll have to see as that develops that indeed the, 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 there's no an overly negative impact on the delivery of the internet. I think it, that's why if we are, when we have guidance, I think it will be important that this guidance is not so specific that it, 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 it's, um, it stops anything, but rather that it gives a good scope of, of what, is a, what is appropriate. That basically we understand, you know, basically the best efforts internet should remain the norm, that you have all sorts of other stuff on the side, fine, but you know, basically let's, let's again keep that open platform working pretty well. So mm. what do my fellow panelists think about the Dutch solution to say mm -hmm. that basically uh, to, to hinder or slow down internet traffic should not be allowed unless it's really necessary for a limited list of legitimate aims? Do the co-panelists see any, uh, me any merit in this uh, solution? Because it's, I think it's very flexible and can be applied very effectively. I actually I would, I would agree with that. I think a lot of people haven't read the full, the full uh, Dutch law, so they don't realize how balanced it is. Um, and actually, if you look at the EU directives, the, the recital that Vesa mentioned actually says, you know, end users should have the ability to access the content of their choice, etc., and comma, without prejudice to the need to preserve the integrity and security of the network, exactly. i.e., yes. if there's congestion uh, at certain times, if there is a security problem, then you should be able to deal with that. And that's on the internet. Then you have the managed services category on the side. That so, doesn't use the same IP infrastructure on the side of the internet, then? So it's beside, beside yeah, okay. the internet, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe I should comment. You have to uh, wait to me if you want to say something, because I don't uh, see any text. Of course, I have to be cautious uh, what I'm saying, because uh, we are still uh, <coughs> uh, drafting our guidance, and uh, before we, uh, we uh, come to public with, uh, with our guidance, um, I have to get an agreement and approval from, uh, from my political masters. But I think... I think uh, what, uh, what Jean-Jacques already highlighted, that we have to say something on, on traffic management. I think this is our clear intention, that uh, it's not only about, uh, only about transparency and what information consumers uh, uh, should be um, provided with and, and how to facilitate switching, but also important aspects of our future guidance is uh, is to say something about uh, transparency. And there, obviously, there are certain things where we, I suppose, we all agree uh, what is considered to be reasonable uh, traffic management. And there we are talking about issues which are necessary to implement in, or in order to uh, 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 safeguard the integrity of network and prevent uh, spa um, spamming and all, all these uh, things which I think overall uh, uh, welfare enhancing for everybody. Then there are, of course, the other side where we are, we are already coming to the gray area, which is uh, traffic management uh, used for, uh, for uh, enforcing uh, certain contractual, uh, enforcing contractual restrictions. Now, of course, there's an issue, as, uh, as uh, Jean-Jacques said, that if you have a situation where the, the consumers can't really exercise their choice if everybody is uh, uh, providing all the restricted uh, uh, Products. And this is, of course, unfortunate if this if this happens. But on the on the other hand, I think it's also part of the consumer consumer choice that uh, that, that they can uh, they can subscribe to a, pr a product uh, where where uh, which is restricted, maybe maybe then uh, maybe then cheaper. But what is their key, of course, is that uh, that uh, that uh, the consumer, the end user has uh, really understood what he's subscribing to and has given a, 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 a explicit uh, agreement uh, to those uh, restrictions. But these are sort of the, uh, just bringing up some, some ideas what uh, we are reflecting when we are thinking of guidance on, on, uh, on uh, traffic management. Okay, are there any questions mm. from the floor? Somewhere? Okay. Uh, okay, Luigi, go ahead while we wait for. Oh no, no, here, here it comes. Without, uh, just a second. Just try only with the microphone without the deal because it's so noisy that uh, it's okay. very difficult for me to speak. Yes, so, hold on. But let me let me make one comment on this fact that the net neutrality 
debate has started in the US. Now, there, is a, there are big differences between US and Europe. What are the differences? In your, as I said, in Europe, we have 1,200 operators, 100 mobile network operators, 200 mobile mo virtual network operators, 1,500 cable operators. In US, they have only six operators, have 99% of the US market. Second, so in Europe, we have a high level of fragmentation, and there are so many competitors that they don't exist in any other part of the world. Second, the level of price in Europe is half of US. So, in other words, in US, the price is, yeah. is much higher than Europe, and there is less competition. Third point, in US, there is no, 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 no regulation. Can we keep the mic on the side of your mouth, please? Keep the mic here. He has taken off his headphones. You're, you're speaking too close to the microphone. I don't hear you at all now. Something broke there. C can I make a very quick comment? Is that all right? Yes, we had some comment. I know, on, I know. On uh, just very, very quick on the US on, situation. Uh, yes, okay. Just very quick, okay. which is do you know how many restrictions there are to internet use Texting. in the US? None. At the moment, there's a proposal for a potential restriction and as a subject of a, of a, of a court case already versus hundreds of restrictions in Europe. That's the main, restrict that's the main observation we see when we make the comparison these days. Sorry, I didn't mean to stop the question. <laughs> okay, then we take the question from the floor. Thank you. Any My name is Bien Poisson, and I have a question regarding to quality of service. When an ISP's quality of service causes it. disruption to a game company, for example, which was happened last spring, one of the 10 most popular video games had all the users from one ISP here in Sweden, basically disrupted for three months, where they could not participate in anything of the game. Should the ISP then be liable? Mm -hmm. I think under the Dutch law it could, um, because under the Dutch law, uh, measures that uh, slow down internet traffic must be necessary and proportionate for a legitimate aim. It doesn't sound like there could be a legitimate aim why for three months uh, a gaming service is being slowed down without stop. So it sounds like this kind of measure would not be allowed uh, under the Dutch law. And um, what I think uh, should be required of internet providers is that they, on a more objective uh, level and on objective requirements, of the time criticalness, the requirements of this type of application uh, uh, make the traffic management. So if there is real congestion, then you should prioritize the more time critical applications over the less time critical. So there can be no discussion that uh, an email can be slowed down slightly to make a voice call uh, work properly. Uh, there can be no discussion that file sharing can be slowed down a bit uh, if that's really necessary to make sure that uh, gamers can have the most uh, responsive experience that they can have. This would be the Dutch law's effect on this situation. Okay, another question? Hi, James Liz. Yeah, I'd like to, to, to thank Luigi for his comment that there's 1,200 operators in the United, uh, across Europe. He also says that these, op that these uh, means that Europe is different from the United States because he says it's fragmented for that reason. Isn't that exactly the reason why it's necessary to have a common framework across Europe that supports a range of services that the hourglass architecture of the internet is designed to do? I'd like to hear comments from, uh, from the panel on how would expecting innovators to make 1,200 separate quality of service <laughs> agreements <laughs> impact innovation? You know I think that is a very good point. I think it cannot be expected, and that is why uh, these kind of proposals, they cannot, it, it doesn't work properly, it doesn't scale well. That's why we have the best, best effort internet, and I think it will stay like that for a long time. Oh, I, I agree, it. I think we need, we need a harmonized solution to net neutrality in Europe, and it's basically the uh, Dutch solution. 
<laughs> uh, okay, I, yes, I, I also uh, believe that, um, well, let's put it this way, that the rules should be applied uh, consistently I mean, uh, in a consistent uh, manner. But of course, the fact that we have a very fragmented market, it's, it of course goes well beyond the net neutrality discussion. I think the, the reasons for that are elsewhere. It's, uh, it's well, there are regulatory reasons. We still uh, have, we regulate markets uh, not only on net neutrality, but uh, on, on all aspects on the national basis. We have national authorization scheme for operators. So there are plenty of regulatory barriers which make the market fragmented. And then, then there's, of course, I, I think one which is a, it's, it's a, has uh, nothing to do with the regulation. Well, we still have national, even if the regulation was uh, consistent, well, well, we still have a national circumstance. The demand structures is different. Uh, oh, there, 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 there are plenty of economic reasons why, why the market is uh, fragmented. But of course, the regulation and all the European regulations aims at uh, lowering these, um, no. these uh, differences. Thank you. Can I just quickly mm. add, mm. I, I don't think it's a bad thing that the market is fragmented mm. in the sense of having 1,200 ISPs. Mm. I'm very glad that there's 1,200 ISPs. It's mm. wonderful if you can have ISPs that are a free man band versus mm. big multinationals. That's great. That's a different story, to, uh, different from having harmonized uh, solutions and protections of net neutrality. Okay, uh, we are slightly over time. I have just one final question for you, Vesa. Uh, if you now try to increase the transparency and increase, of, in, increase the possibility of switching, so you'll get uh, to the operator that gives you the, the, the service that you want to. Uh, since we see that virtually all internet access providers in Europe also are telecommunication operators that are running telecommunication switching systems on the side, so to speak. And that is mm. a potential mm. um, conflict commercially with Skype, for example. And then we have uh, the, the movie industry coming into not managed services, but over the internet. And some of them also runs cable TV. Uh, with that same interest from all the operators to protect some other of their business, is it really possible to, 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 to get to a meaning, meaningful ch choice for the users then, when they all have the same technology and the same business on the side to protect? Well, as I, as I said, I mean, I think we all agree that we have to do something on transparency and switching, and we have to give a competition a chance, but, uh, but uh, this is probably not enough, so we have to do also also something else. And it's not only that what we are saying about uh, traffic, traffic management, I think it's the whole, whole the regulatory landscape where we have to take this into account. Yes. Um, okay. I would like to add to that uh, a little bit, uh, going on the analogy uh, between democracy and the democracy in the internet. Uh, just like in constitutional democracies, the right to vote alone is not enough. You need constitutional rights and legal safeguards of constitutional rights. Uh, the same applies to the internet. Uh, the right to vote is not enough. You need a strong legal protection uh, to protect the user's interest and freedom. Okay. Good point. Uh, just to finish, I hope that next year I come to Internet Dagarna to speak about something else than net neutrality, <laughs> and that I'll be instead in the bar drinking champagne with all of you to congratulate the European Commission for its great <laughs> guidance protecting net neutrality. Yes, okay. Um, by then, I think we have to round this off now, um, since we are um, 10 minutes over time here now. This is the last session of, 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 of the conference. Um, we don't have time to look into another thing that has been heavily debated in this, in, 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 on the internet, and that is the proposal from Luigi from, from Etno about uh, the payment system, where the uh, sending party network pays to the receiving party network and the implications that might have on net neutrality. There are a lot of discussions on that on the internet. But there will be many more forums, and um, I'm very gra grateful to you. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I don't hear you right now. Could you turn off on his microphone? Just hang on a second. You hear me? Yes. Uh, no, okay, now, I, now we hear you. May, may I add one comment? That yes. Is Apart of the fragmentation that has been discussed and I think has been recognized that is a, is a big difference with US. There are, I would like to make also, a pro there is a problem because we have a, a, a different treatment from the same services considered in a in different way. I will make an example. IP interconnection. Re and, and VESA is there. 
uh, VEZA is there. Uh, according to the EU regulation, the EU framework, the Pintech connection is a telecom service. It's within the European communication service. According to the US regulation, it's not a telecom service. So you see that there are a lot of issues that should be discussed, and we should decide whether is a telecom service, is not a telecom service, and we should have the same treatment. Yes, okay. There is a lot of discussion now what is in the, how the definition of the international telecommunication regulation should be changed, because right now data processing in ICT is not within the regulation, and that is one thing that is up from many countries, because it's the countries there that discuss. Otherwise, others can just propose to the countries to put it up. Uh, but that is a, a WCIT uh, session, and we don't have that here now, and we don't have time. I do thank you all for, 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 for your inputs here, and especially to Lu Luigi that uh, uh, endured to take your time to try this. And we have heard you well, very good quality. Mm. Um, and um, uh, sorry for the, for, for, for the mix-up here with, with, with the sound from your side and so on. But we have gotten your message as well. And it was good that you had the opportunity, because I wanted to have all sides to be able to argue their case much. here. I mean, I sort myself, so I have an opinion, but much. I'm trying to be a neutral moderator. Thank you.